Star Wars. Star Wars! What a massive franchise, according to Wikipedia's list of largest grossing franchises. My favourite part of Star Wars was that time in that movie when Ears McGee turns to Samuel L. Jackson and says, Thrusters are at maximum shield, El Capitan. Perhaps diplomacy is the answer? And Jean-Luc Godard goes, Oui, oui, make it so. And phases are set to poor special effects. But Whoopi Goldberg arrived just in time and says, Bitch, are you for real? Okay guys, I'm going to be honest with you. If your name is Giorgio Lucas Schatz or Walter Stosny, please avert the gaze of your ear holes now. I'm not that into Star Wars, which is a shame because the Star Wars universe, or SWU, is one that is very rich and is where a lot of cool stories can take place. Nevertheless, it never really grabbed my attention. As an example of how uninterested in Star Wars I was, I did not see the original film, Chapter 4 New Hope, until I was 26, which happened in the year 2015 and I watched it on a laptop on a plane. And after watching it, I was like, yeah, that's pretty cool. But of course, by that point, I had pretty much absorbed the entire plot of the original trilogy by cultural osmosis. So when Star Wars Shadows of the Empire for the Nintendo 64 ended up in my game collection, which I can only assume that my dad's interest in Star Wars was the reason, I played it a bit, but not too much. I remember I found it quite cool, but also extremely difficult in places. So this is going to be unique compared to my other Nintendo 64 retrospectives, as my nostalgia might perhaps not hit as hard for this game and I now have adult fingers with my adulto gaming skills, which I spell with a Z, to get through the hard bits and emulate the save states. So you know the rules, I can give it a score right now. Here I go. 6.5 out of 10, there, see? But the score doesn't matter. Now let me explain, if you will be so kind as to let me, why Shadows of the Empire is almost a classic. And for the record, I'll review the Nintendo 64 version, not the PC version that came out later and had FMV cinematics with voice acting, and face models that were state of the art at no time whatsoever. So I don't think I'm missing out on much here. Like I said, I didn't play it that much. I did play it, but not because it was Star Wars, but because it was a game that I had for a game console that I also had. But I never played it that much or for that long or to 100% completion. And the reason for that is that it was hard. It was too hard for my baby hands to play. And there was another reason too. It was scary. Those scary Wookiees, the deadly bosses. It was too spoopy for a young 18 year old me. The only thing scary at the time was talking to girls. But now as a 48 year old man, I lack the fear response and urinary control for either of those things to be an issue anymore. So let's discuss why this game is almost a classic. And by aesthetic, I mean the graphics and the sound. This is the Nintendo 64, so nothing looks great in an objective sense, but things looked really great for the Nintendo 64. Dash render was impressively well modeled. I mean, look at that face and those cheeks. Even his gun, his shoes, his jetpack texture. It was all impressive to me, when my only point of comparison was other Nintendo 64 games. This may be due to the game being developed cross-platform, including the more powerful PC, but even human enemies resembled, well, humans. The mechanical enemies strongly resembled their actual models from the films. Even little things impressed me, like Dash's laser blast being a 3D object, I assume. His accuracy could use some work though. And the levels similarly impressed me with their scale and detail. Strong texture work tied it closely to the movie's visuals. Even though the textures felt quite small, a well-known limitation of the Nintendo 64, the way they were stretched made places feel grand, and indoor structures felt very Star Wars-y. On another note, the visuals have this bit of static. It's very subtle, so I'll try and focus on it. But it's something I've not seen in any other Nintendo 64 game, but it made it feel like I was playing a movie. The cutscenes similarly are pretty neat. It mainly consists of a lot of pixelated space backdrops and simple 3D models of flying ships in front. It's all very cute, but still very cinematic as the developers would often add foreground elements to obscure the ship. In cutscenes with people, the characters would appear as pixelated sprites, and in these scenes, with our heroes or the baddie bad guys, their pixelated faces with the animated expressions strike me as very unique 
a style that no longer exists since the advent of 3D gaming, but one I find aesthetically pleasing. And I think it's neat how everyone waits for you to press the A button. Now I don't care what you say, that's just polite. And the music. Every track in the game felt like John Williams composed it. Which he might have done, I don't know. You think I researched this? Okay, I was partially right. A lot of the score was composed by Williams, which is understandably fantastic. My favourites are probably the Battle of Hoth and Rebel Base tracks. Probably because they are the first two levels of the game, so I heard them a lot. But the Junkyard level theme also slaps. It has momentum to the beat that matches the high speed gameplay of the level. But the Shadows of the Empire theme and the themes for the later levels were done by John McNeely, which could be a pseudonym of John Williams. The music matches so well. The theme is great, very ominous and dark. Honestly, I like it all. And they must have used some kind of magic to get that orchestra sound on the MIDI format. Just, mwah. And the best part of the game, in my humble, fantastic opinion, is the campaign. And by campaign, I do not mean story. I couldn't give two farts about what happened in the story. Sure, there's Han Solo and Diet Han Solo, which is our character, Dash Rendar. And Dash does all these things while the events of the original Star Wars trilogy play out. No, what I'm talking about is the levels, which you don't need a story for. But each level does flow narratively to the next. And if some time passes, then a text scroll informs the players of what's happened. You always have context for each level. And while there's not a huge number of levels, they're so diverse in terms of theme and also gameplay. So let's go through mentioning the highlights. First, we are on the ice planet of Hoth in a space plane shooting the zap zaps at Star Wars enemies, which is a great introduction to the classic baddies. Each has different mobilities and require different tactics to take down. For instance, attack the droids quickly, attack the ATSTs from behind, and the AT-ATs, to take them down, you need a tow cable, which happens in an awesome and cinematic mini set piece. I did find it frustrating repeatedly going on a slow raid for an ATST, whittle its health down slightly, and zoom out to do a big turn and repeat the process. My aim was too poor and their health was too large that so the process got repetitive. But overall, this level is so good that it single-handedly gave birth to the Rogue Squadron game series. Don't ask me how something can single-handedly give birth to anything. Perhaps God was involved. The big G. But yeah, the code from this game was in fact used as a template for the development of the Rogue Squadron series, specifically Rogue Squadron for the Nintendo 64, which was released two years later. With the shields down, apparently we are now an Echo Base, perhaps my favourite level of the game. We are no longer on a ship, but now a sexy hunk of a man. Look at those polygons. Man. This time, quick firing our blaster like some kind of ice western, heading down corridors with danger around every corner, in rooms full of the terrifying Wampa enemy, which you could all take on at once, or unlock their jail cell, fuck off, and let them take each other down, with you returning to shoot the winner. And later, when you see some of the droids from the first level, except now as a human, they appear much bigger. Boss foreshadowing? And then there was a cool room where the ice started breaking, forcing you to do a combination of running, jumping, and shooting. And the in-game cutscene watching the Millennium Falcon take off was awesome. It's also the first level where I really notice the enemies give the Wilhelm scream if they die and fall off the edge. And the boss is a giant ATST. Well, a normal sized ATST. I noticed how the boxes here have simple physics. Hey, that's neat. Hey, that's pretty good. And I love how the level ends inside your ship. It's like an interior within an interior, no loading zone. Again, something unusual for the Nintendo 64. You escape with your ship that is not the Millennium Falcon and start the third level back in space, flying away from Echo Base into an asteroid field. Unlike the first level, you cannot move your ship. You can only rotate your gun and take down TIE Fighters and TIE Bombers. It feels like the most hastily developed level, cause that's the whole level. Once you've defeated a certain number of TIE Fighters and Bombers, you're out. You have escapoed. I found it difficult to aim at anything other than red asteroids, which gave you a challenge point. Hey, that's pretty good. But the ships move quite fast and again my aim was rubbish. Thank goodness for target sensing rockets that automatically generate over time. Now the fourth level is on a train. On a nope, a train. Get ready for some platforming, jumping and crouching like you're playing Hole in the Wall, which is an Australian TV show that not even I've heard of. This level has a number of cool set pieces with combat areas and really tiny ships, train jumping shenanigans and combinations of the two, as the adjoining trains contain more men to shoot. And kiss? This is the first of many bullshit difficulty levels. You will die many times, most often falling from a train due to Dash's incredibly imprecise controls. And don't jump when the train is turning as your momentum will just fling you off the train. The level has some cool detail visually speaking, but you don't get much time to appreciate it. And it ends with a boss fight with IG-88, 
a pants soilingly scary proposition to eight year old me, but it is a cool boss arena. The next level I remember as a kid feeling grand and mysterious. The level geometry is absolutely massive and most of it is hidden behind the fog of hardware limitations. Here I noticed Dash's wide turning circle, which on narrow walkways is a death sentence. This level has a great mix of natural environment and man-made structure, including a rematch with the ATST, and I discovered completely by myself that you can just fly behind and shoot him in the back, repeat, and then get impatient and get shot in the face a bunch. I started getting the hang of peeking around corners and taking pot shots at guys, and the game really makes shooting guys feel good, although they are ambushing me in more unfair ways. Once you get the jetpack, the level gets even more massive, and secret areas even more secret, and ends with another boss fight with Boba Fett, which is... Well, C Section 3. It's cool, but it has issues. Next level, we need to protect Mark Hamill. So obviously jump on a hover bike and take care of these guys in order to protect that national treasure. This facsimile of Moss Eisley is adorable. I can definitely see the resemblance when I'm standing still. When I'm moving, everything is a blur. The controls are not great. Even Dash has no idea where he's going. Controls aside, I really like the idea of the level. It's essentially a race, but a race where you must destroy your opponents before the finish line, not just beat them. Out of the city, you come across some fantastic outdoor environments and obstacles, a spaceship taking off, the famous Sarlacc pits. But do you remember how I said controls aside? More like controls ass side. One cannot simply put the controls aside for this level. You can't appreciate the level. I mean, look at this crap. It was as hard as it looks and as vomit inducing as it also looks. Honestly, the controls are so hideously sensitive and dash goes so ridiculously fast. And the course has so much collision, both visible and invisible that you spend most of this level mid-accident. Hopefully you only bump and lose all momentum, losing ground in the chase, because the other option is to combust, which is not as preferable in my humble opinion. The next level is the Imperial Freighter, and while controls are still bad, with Dash being almost as slidey as the hover bike, I got back into the swing of things shooting dudes around corners. I don't have much to say about this level, visually it is drab. It has a tendency to throw enemies unfairly at you, either some hatches open up as you walk past or at the end of an elevator ride, it had some platforming, which was atrocious. The coolest room in this one provided you to work out that these panels here control the cargo doors. They are not set decoration, which of course I knew. There is a final battle with a droid, but he isn't too hard, as long as you keep your distance from him. And in the level, catching the ship to the... Sewers! <coughs> Yummy! The sewers on the whole are pretty cool. The levels are ramping up the amount of secrets, but also the amount of flying droidy things, so it's give and take. It also introduces swimming sections in the green poo water, which you can mostly avoid because you know there's all kinds of COVID in that ship. But I feel the levels are getting less unfair and on the whole, I started to enjoy my time with the jetpack. And Dash's regular ass walking controls continue to not jive with the collision of this level. Something I was painfully aware of in the first spiral room. Until the boss, which is so big you can't even see it properly. It hits like a mother, just you have to find the eye and shoot it with some seekers. The water drains and then you get direct access to the next level, Zyzer's Palace, which smoothly transitions from the sewers. Secrets galore again, with lots of special ammo which you really need, trust me. The level is a lot of human enemies and droids, which in the scheme of things are easier cause Dash is a larger target to aim for. And their accuracy is even worse than Dash's, especially if they are so far away they can't recognize that they're being shot, resulting in slow tedious combat where you just stand and shoot and wait for RNG to do its work. Overall it's nothing special in either level design or set pieces, but the boss, my god, I don't know whether to be turned on or deceased. I guess I would prefer to be turned on, but this boss is very hard, and so am I. But this droid boss is very difficult. It actually has three phases. The first you can stick behind him and chip his health away with a laser. Then for phases two and three, use any special ammo to get it over and done with ASAP. Leading into the last level, I've been talking about how the controls are mostly shit. Well in this level, they are so bad I had to change the fucking inputs. You are in the Centennial Hawk, aiming the turret to hit enemies and prevent bombs reaching you. Which is easier said than done, the lightest nudge on the stick causes the reticle to swing wildly, like it is visual garbage, I can't do anything about it. God must exist because I managed to survive and make it to the Skyhawk, and the controls pick up, much like my enjoyment. It has strong Rogue Squadron vibes, a bit floatier than Rogue Squadron, but unlike Rogue Squadron, it consists of a huge 3D space in, well, space. You must fly around, taking out four turrets, which you need your recharging missiles to do, and then fly down each arm and destroy the core from each side, until it gets destroyed and you have to race out while the screen turns red. It's like Star Fox, but not as good. Leading to the end, Dash doesn't seem to get out. Luke Skywalker has a bit of a cry because Dash is such a great original character, do not steal. And Dash was alive the whole time, that rascal, that scallywag. My God, those teeth. 
After the credits, the game tells me to get all challenge points on hard to get a secret ending. Now, I ain't doing that, but I did look it up online and found what the extra ending was and it is not worth it. Overall, the campaign was really unique, very diverse covering multiple types of gameplay, level design and aesthetics, yet all feeling very strongly Star Wars TM Copyright LLC, only let down consistently by the controls. It was spiced up, however, by the... The campaign throws bosses thick and fast at you, with six of the nine levels having a boss at the end, and all bosses are threatening and challenging. And there is a short cut scene just before the confrontation to really set the scene. And then the fight itself, these bosses have felt visually menacing. <clears throat> with their weapon equipped, they felt like hunters, and I am the prey. To touch on the first boss of the game, the ATST came out of the blue. You just turn a corner and kablam, there it is. We saw these enemies and took them down in the spaceship in the previous half level. But now one massive one taken from a different perspective presents a huge challenge and it was a very cool moment. And as the player you must freak out constructively and run around the room to look for strategies and how to fight it. All the bosses had a variety of weapons that they'd use and what was unique was that the player can access these same weapons. However, they need to find ammo for them, which is often hidden in secret areas. These ammo counters were retained across levels, raising the value of these secrets, as it is very important to save up on seeker and other special weapon ammo during regular gameplay and use them specifically for boss encounters. And in another cool visual flourish, bosses would visually show the amount of damage they received, with IG-88 looking more beaten up and Boba Fett igniting on fire. The game would often throw multi-phase boss encounters at you, with varying levels of success. I'm not a huge fan of Salve 1, Boba Fett's ship, as I could not find a useful strategy. But for bosses like the Gladiator, each phase changes both the strategy to defeat the boss as well as the boss arena itself. And while the bosses were cool, it was the boss arenas that felt very unique and interesting to me. From the ATST in the Echo Base, with health and ammo requiring a bit of platforming to reach, to IG-88, my favourite boss room encounter, where you start on the train that barreled through the gates. His arena is filled with piles of rubbish, many walkways, and even a furnace where you could jump inside for some invincibility. Boba Fett's arena had gaps on the side, and if you floated down with your jetpack, you'd come across some handy items. This area I feel like in other games would just be a drop to insta-death, but not this game. Even in the less complicated boss areas like the Imperial Freighter or the Sewers, they were simple rooms but still felt like real areas in the Star Wars TM universe. With the windows to space in the Freighter or the huge geometry and valve exit in the Sewers, and the dead remains of the boss you just defeated, they didn't have to go this hard. And in the Gladiator boss's later phases, the arena becomes a maze with both enemies and power-ups creating an interesting risk reward to the player of diverting attention from the boss hunting you down in search for possible health and ammo. Overall, I do not remember many games with secret areas in the boss rooms, but Shadows of the Empire does that, and these secret areas often housed health and challenge points and made the arenas feel much more real and interesting. What was not so great about the boss encounters was playing them. They were generally pretty hard, each would chip away a few lives from your stash if you were lucky. Cause this is one of those old fashioned games where if you run out of lives, that's it, start again. Bosses would chase you down and when close would attack you with various arsenal. It is wise to stay out of their immediate range and things like the flamethrower will eviscerate your health. Unless they are one of the many bosses in the game where the best approach is to stick to their tushy and shoot them in the back. In many encounters there will be an exchange of gunfire and you will quickly find that your health is going down much faster than theirs. It is tricky with the tank controls to rotate around and bugger off without taking too much damage. And that's if the bosses don't dodge themselves. iJet is a pretty good sport and will just stand there taking punishment. In fact most of the robots are pretty compliant in this respect, but Boba Fett gets one measly blaster scraping his testicle and he pisses off. He moves so quickly I barely get a shot off. I spend most of my time flying around looking for him and getting shot in the back. No fun. They can move much more freely than I can. It's almost as if the bosses, like the levels, have a great design, aesthetic and arenas, but are let down by the... Okay, I have to talk about this. In my Mario review, I said what made the game great was great levels, with great challenges, that should be completed with a fantastic control scheme. Shadows of the Empire does the first two well, and fails spectacularly at the last. Mm. There are three kinds of controls in the game. When you are a spaceship, when you are on a hoverbike, and when you are on your tootsies like a regular homo sapien. And all of them are rubbish. In none do I ever feel in control of my character, defeating the naming convention of a controller. 
Out of the three, the aerial controls in the flying sections are the least shit. In a plane you can speed up, slow down, do a tight U-turn. Still there's many areas of improvement, it's missing the U-turn like Star Fox that would make flybys and Hoth much easier. And the slow turn is dreadfully slow. And also I do wish there was some auto aim. But the controls still feel floaty, which makes much more sense in a spaceship than a human male. But still felt behind the 8-ball when compared to other Nintendo 64 games, like Star Fox as well as the Rogue Squadron series of games, which controlled much better overall. It's when you're on your two leggies that things really go to shit. If there's any motherfucker who can make running on land look like he's skating on ice, it's this guy. The controls are so slippery and slidey. Running at a slight angle feels like Dash is a two-ton car drifting sideways in the streets of Tokyo. He goes super fast too, and on small level geometry, this all adds up to being a disaster. Without rails, expect to careen yourself off the edge many times. Jumping is incredible. Incredibly bad. Dash's jump is huge and he absolutely launches himself. When you press jump, Dash leaps with a slight delay, making this noise. And sails through the air in low gravity. I believe I can fly. You cannot correct your trajectory mid-air, which would make Isaac Newton happy, but me, not so much. While you are committed to that direction, you can still turn in mid-air. That's why I have a lot of footage where I realise I've stuffed up the jump and try to salvage it and end up just pirouetting gracefully to my doom. And as Dash lands, you can see him look down, even well before he lands. And I realised, when he jumps, even he doesn't know where he's going. I don't know where he's going. Everyone is fucked in this situation. And it only takes a single button press to get here. He also slides as he lands, adding an extra seasoning of difficulty. Not to mention walls can straight up push Dash off or nudge his jump out of alignment. Overall, platforming is extremely challenging in this game and will lead to your death more often than blasters from enemies. There are a ton of camera angles in this game. As a kid, I used to play with a normal camera angle, but as an adulto, I much prefer the control in these sections from the first person view. Dash's sweet cheeks just take up too much of my damn screen's real estate. I probably missed this option as a kid, as you have to scroll past all the extremely cinematic Watch Dash Get Shot cam directed by Martin Scorsese. But while there's a metric shit ton of camera options, the game is missing some key controls that would make it feel so much better. Namely strafing. Strafing would make shooting so much easier. But as it stands, you must use tank controls to nudge Dash to the edge of the corner, and hopefully he can shoot enemies without them shooting you. And shooting is a bit of a mess too. Dash's aim is worse than a stormtrooper. There is luckily some very generous order aim, but bullets still fire with a random angle, so there is still some luck. As a result, firefights simply become Dash getting vaguely face to face with an enemy, rapidly fire as quickly as your fingies allow and hope that your bullets randomly hit. It becomes super obvious that I'm standing waiting for random hits to break the boxes rather than miss. You can actually manually aim your shots better, but not only is luck still a factor, there is no target reticule, which I'd argue is pretty fucking necessary to manually aim at something. And finally there is a third form of control, the hover bike. I have only two words for this, literally uncontrollable. There is a reason why we've not seen a hover bike level in another game, at least not with this level design. The extremely sensitive and insane speed simply does not jive with the small level geometry. I simply cannot explain this gameplay footage. Next section. To counter the expected deaths at the hands of the bosses and the unexpected deaths at the hand of the controls are the challenge points. Each level houses an unknown number of them until you complete the level, and the more you acquire, the more bonus lives you will receive at the end of the level. These again increase the value of level secrets, just like the special ammo, but independently important as the ammo lets you dish out damage a bit faster, whereas the challenge points, i.e. lives, allow you to take more damage before ending the run. They vary from level to level, usually on foot sections they are found in side areas not essential for progression, or little out of the way hidey holes that you can access, which becomes a bit of a paradigm shift once you get the jetpack and can feasibly access areas very far away. They reward daring players who would explore everything in the level. In the flying sections, the challenges become performance based. Take down an ATAT in Hoth led to a challenge point. Shooting red asteroids for a challenge point, and so on. An obvious necessity as these levels are more restricted in their design and movement. And in the hoverback level, despite being mechanically similar to the flying level, the challenge points are inextricably set up like the on foot levels, being put down small side streaks and putting you further back in your chase of the bad guys. Honestly, I saw several way off the map, a few in the air requiring a well time jump that I couldn't do for the life of me and others that I'll only be able to acquire by crashing and exploding into it. Overall, the challenge points are a bit archaic in their design, only needed to keep your lives up to avoid a game over, which makes less sense for console games, as you can simply start the game again. I would recommend that players get as many challenge points as possible in the early game, 
where things are less serious and exploration is more fun, as you will need to stock up on lives for the bosses in the late game. And be careful as the game will save your life counter as you go, resulting in players putting themselves in a position where they cannot complete the game with the number of lives they have remaining. To counter this, later levels are filled with a tremendous number of challenge points. More than I found, but also more challenging to acquire. But if you find you lost too many lives in a level, it's best to retry and maybe save on a different save file, in order to keep those lives in the bank. The developers of this game really swung for the fences with Shadows of the Empire. To switch analogies mid-paragraph, they really threw all the fecal matter they could at a wall and seeing what sticks. But what did stick? Well, nothing actually. Which is surprising because poop is quite sticky. So when I say Shadows of the Empire is almost a classic, what I really mean to say is that it's an objectively shit game. The graphics are so bad that you could build your house out of Dash Rendar's torso and it would probably be a pretty good house. And yes, it has many different types of gameplay, but as a result, the game was very taxing on the developers and as a result, each mode suffers from its own lack of polish. Dash controls like a geriatric tank. Controls even get worse with the jetpack. The hover bike is not much better, and unfortunately the poor control scheme and feel of the on-foot sections is a large chunk of the game, as he mostly plays Dash himself, only sometimes jumping across high-speed trains. But mostly not on trains, or in the toxic pool under said trains. As a non-Star Wars fan, it's quite surprising to me that my favourite part of the game is the Star Wars bit. The cool characters we get brief insights into before the missions, like who is this Han Solo? I seriously wanted to know more about IG-88, Boba Fett and Dash. The worlds are so varied from each other and the levels are so full of mystery, like the canyon level or the echo base. Finding secrets and hidden collectibles in this game will always be special to me. Part of that specialness was not just the variety of locations but also the variety of gameplay. The flight sections were an obvious standout and template for the later Rogue Squadron games, and the airbag section similarly was developed into the well-received Pod Racer game. Both Rogue Squadron and Pod Racer were fantastically fun and much better games in the technical sense, and that would always be the magnificent legacy of Shadows of the Empire. And yet for me, there is something more special in this game, which I believe stems from the passion that the developers had making it. The same passion that led them to try and cram six games into one. The passion that led them to so many cool ideas being put in, resulting in me crapping my pants at the side of the first boss encounter with an ATST, or that time when I crap my pants in the room where there are two Wompers, just before the excitement of realizing that you can get them to fight each other, or the thrill of jumping across high speed trains over lethal poop, or railroading enemies at high speed into Sarlacc pits, or the ore jumping huge bottomless caverns with a jetpack. And that is why for me, this game is a classic. Almost. Dash Renda. He's the man whose name you'd love to touch, but you mustn't touch. His name sounds good in your ear, but when you say it, you mustn't fear, cause his name can be said by anyone. Oh shit, his name was copyright TMLLC. I've used that joke way too much in this video. <laughs>